In church, it is good to gather, to celebrate the gospel while we sing the gospel. Death crushed to death and life ours to live. And we may feel the sting of death at times now, but the day is coming when we will feel its sting no more. And we look forward to that day. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 3. While you're turning there, um, just a, a quick word on this evening. We are certainly glad to be together in worship this morning, but we're looking forward to being together again this evening. Uh, we'll gather this evening at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary where we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. And after that, we're going into the fellowship hall for soups and chilies and all those sorts of things. So... Uh, Hope you got your recipes ready to go. Bring those crock pots ready to go. We'll have all the other stuff we need. But uh, looking forward to sharing that food together. And for those who want to, uh, should be a good evening. We're going to go out around the fire down here toward the barn and uh, have a little uh, campfire, do some s'mores, things like that. There's the playground down there for the kids. I think there may be something going on the screen or whatever else. But we're just looking forward to sharing that fellowship together as we gather this evening. So I hope you'll come be a part of that. We are in Mark chapter 3. And uh, before we get into the text, I'll just kind of share a few things by way of introduction. I'm going to be dealing this morning with a very important question, asking ourselves, who is Jesus? And, uh, you know, hopefully we all have a way that we can answer that question and answer it well. Uh, trying to answer that question throughout the ages, people have come up with a lot of ways to try to think this through. And I'm going to introduce you to an idea that maybe you've not heard of before in terms of its particular title, but you know the argument nonetheless. Philosophers and theologians throughout the ages have contemplated the question of what they call the great trilemma. Now again, you may not be familiar with that phrase, but you probably know something about the argument itself. It has to do with the ultimate question of who Jesus really is. And it's certainly a question that has to be asked, and it has to be answered for every one of us. It's a question that affects every one of us and will affect us for eternity. And so it's a question that, depending on how we answer it, has eternal implications with regard to our salvation. Now, this, this is a question that considers the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the things that he has claimed about himself throughout the course of his ministry. Jesus has revealed himself, we see in the Gospels, as the Son of God, who's come in the flesh who has come to do his Father's will. Uh, he has claimed all power and authority that belongs to God, even though he's exercising that authority under the authority of his Father in submission to him. Jesus comes able to heal the sick, to cure otherwise incurable diseases. He makes the lame walk, the blind to see. He cleanses lepers, the deaf hear. Even the dead will live again because of Christ. And yet his greatest claim that we saw a few weeks ago was that he had the power to forgive sin and to offer eternal life. Now, a lot of people will look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, and they'll see a lot of wonderful things. And so they'll say things like, Jesus was a good man. He did a lot of good things to help a lot of hurting people. We'd, we'd all be better off if we'd be a little bit more like him, if we'd listen to him, if we'd follow his example. The world would be a better place. People will look to Jesus and they'll say these things and they'll believe those things to be true, but a lot of people will never go beyond that. He was a good man, a kind man, a helpful man, a great teacher, but they won't go anywhere beyond that. So when you start to talk about some of the claims that Jesus made, claims about sin, about judgment, about salvation, how we can be forgiven our sin. When you start talking about Jesus' divinity, his divine glory, the things like that, a lot of times people will shut down that discussion there. They're happy with a good man who was kind and helpful and did good things, but they really don't want to get too deep into those sorts of questions. Sometimes they don't believe the things the Bible says about Jesus could possibly be true. But if they're not, then what does that really say about Jesus? What kind of person was he? if these things that he claimed about himself were not actually true. If all of this were just some sort of great deception, then Jesus was not a very good man. He was not a very moral man. And he wouldn't be a very good teacher if so much of what he said was built on a lie. So the conclusion has been made, and I'm sure you've heard this language before, 
that Jesus was either a lunatic, he was a liar, or he is Lord. How many of you have heard that language before? That is the, the way that we would understand what was historically called the great trilemma. So there's this assessment that Jesus is lunatic or liar or Lord, and it has roots that go back to the early days of the Christian church. The early church fathers had a saying, aut deus ad homo malus, which literally translates either God, either God or a bad man. That was what you could know about Jesus. Either he was God or he was a bad man. Other people took this further. You, you go through history, and we'll step forward quite a bit. You go to the 1800s, a Scottish preacher by the name of John Duncan Duncan famously said this, he said, Christ is either one, he either deceived mankind by conscious fraud, or two, he himself was deluded and self-deceived, or three, he was divine. And this is where the language comes from. He says, there is no getting out of this great trilemma. It is inexorable. There's no escape. Watchman Nee, later in 1936, said that a person who claims to be God must fall into one of three categories. First, if he claims to be God and yet in fact is not, then he has to be a madman or a lunatic. Second, if he is neither God nor a lunatic, he has to be a liar, deceiving others by his lie. Third, if he is neither of these, then he must be God. You can only choose one of the three possibilities. If you do not believe that he is God, you have to consider him a madman. If you cannot take him for either of the two, you have to take him for a liar. There is no need for us to prove if Jesus of Nazareth is God or not. All we have to find out is if he is a lunatic or a liar. And if he is neither, he must be the Son of God. And perhaps it was C.S. Lewis who most famously brought this out, and some of you have read his book, Mere Christianity. In Mere Christianity, Lewis writes about this. This was in 1952. But here's a, a quote from that book. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. So it seems obvious to me that either he was a lunatic, that he was neither lunatic nor fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Now, if you read Lewis's writings, you'll find he was a man who started in a Christian home, reject that, became a committed atheist. But God overcame that and brought him to faith. And he had to rethink so many of the positions that he had taken. But this brings us to this idea here. Either Jesus was lunatic or liar or Lord. And no doubt there are some people who will try to get around this. Some will simply deny the existence of Jesus. It's easy. You don't have to classify him anywhere if you say he never was. Um, those folks have a hard time making their case, by the way. History is not really on their side there. Others would confess that there was a man named Jesus who was a very popular teacher of great historic significance, but they would deny that Jesus ever said or did many of the things that the Gospels claim he said and did. And again, you can give yourself an out there. Oh, yeah, Jesus was here, but he never said those things they wrote in the book. Well, if you want to claim that, then you can find some way to get around this, right? But again, they're making their argument based upon their own reasoning. They deny the existence of God. They deny the existence of miracles. So they can't accept the things that are written about Jesus in the scripture to be true. So again, they don't have much to go on in terms of history or actual evidence. They're just trying to find what they can do to avoid having to answer this question. But the fact is, we're, we're forced to answer this question, who is Jesus? And when we ask that question, and when we think about it in these terms, who was Jesus? He was lunatic, he was liar, he was Lord. A lot of times that discussion comes back to the passage we're in, in Mark chapter 3 this morning. And, so, uh, and, and it does that for good reason, because we're going to find as we go through the scripture here, three different groups of people, and the way that they dealt with the Lord Jesus. The first group thought there was something wrong with Jesus. They claim he was out of his mind. So they would call him a lunatic. 
The second group of people, unable to deny his power and his miracles, claimed that he was deceiving everyone. He, he did not come from God. He was actually a devil in disguise. And so they would say that Jesus was a liar. And then were those who came to him, who became his closest companions, who loved him, who trusted him, who devoted themselves to him, who would call him Lord. So that's what we're going to see as we work our way through the scripture today. And we're going to do our best to interact here with God's word and try to understand it here. So we're in Mark chapter 3. I'm going to be looking this morning at verse, verses 20 through 35, finishing this chapter, if the Lord gives us time for that. Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. And I would invite you, if you're able, to stand as we read God's word together. Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Then he went home. And the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. And he called them to him, and he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter... But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal... For they were saying... And a crowd was sitting around, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God... He is my brother and sister and mother. We'll stop there. You can be seated. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would use it to guide us. Help us to understand what we're reading today. Help us to draw from it those things that you would have us to know. And God, I pray that you would use your word to transform us, to change us, to make us into the image of your son so that we can live for your glory. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there's a lot in that passage of Scripture. We're going to do our best to work our way through it today. Um, But uh, looking at this idea, this question, who is Jesus? We have a scene kind of set for us here in Mark chapter 3, verse 20. We read that he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that he could not even eat. Now, you think about where we were before. Uh, Jesus has healed a man in the synagogue. They've gone out from there. He withdraws with his disciples to the sea, and a crowd follows them there. And there's ministry that happens in that moment. And then Jesus goes up to a mountain. And that's where he calls and sets apart the 12 apostles. He appoints them for their task that they're going to do. And that's kind of where we were last week. But eventually, they come down from the mountain, and we read here that they went home. And once again, the large crowds are pressing in from every side. We saw earlier that he even had them put a boat offshore when they were ministering by the seaside in case he needed to escape because the crowds were so great and pressing in from every side. And we see that nothing has really changed here. The crowds are gathered again now where Jesus has gone home to this home that would have belonged to Peter and Andrew. And he's he's there and he's he's going for a place of, of rest, it seems. And yet the crowds come pressing in. And they come to the point that they're not even able to eat. Now, James actually alluded to already the fact that the Gospels tell us the same story, but from different viewpoints. And what you'll find when you read through the Gospels is that there are events that may happen sometimes that if you're just reading through one of the Gospels, you might miss. And I think between the time when Jesus appoints his 12 and they come down from the mountain and they go back to their home, there were likely some other things that were going on in the interim of this. Uh, matter of fact, we know for sure of at least one thing because James has already read it for us this morning. But there are things that happen before Jesus leaves the mountain when he goes back home. And so depending upon how you want to follow the timeline, it's possible that the Sermon on the Mount would have taken place 
before Jesus went back to his home here. Um, you, you look at Matthew, you look at Luke, you get the timelines are a little different there as far as how they've recorded those events, so you have to think that through. It's possible that that took place. The timeline in, in, in Matthew shows that there were certainly more miracles that happened, and including right before this, this miracle where a man who was possessed of a demon, who, and who as a result was blind and mute, he was being healed. There were likely other miracles that were performed and more and lessons that were taught. If you look at Luke chapter 7, it's, it's likely that all that happens in Luke chapter 7 takes place between Mark 3.19 and Mark 3.20. So there are other events that are happening along the way as Jesus is making his way back to this sort of home base in Capernaum. But we see especially that miracle that unfolded, and that's going to be important as we move on reading through here. But it's clear here that Jesus and his disciples, they go back to Capernaum, they're settling in at this home, and the crowds are pressing in to the point that they're not even able to take time to eat. You've been there before, you're so busy there's no time for food, especially some of you who work in uh, types of uh, places where there are other folks around you who have needs. You get what you can get when you get it. And it seems like that's the situation here for Jesus and for his disciples. The crowds are pressing in. And then in verse 21, we're introduced to this first group of people who are going to respond to Jesus in a certain way. We read there that when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Well, heard what? Not entirely sure. Um, whether it was particularly this instance, they know the crowds are gathered in, and perhaps they're understanding that Jesus maybe is beginning to put himself in a little bit of danger. You have a situation here where we have Jesus' own family here who is uh, coming out here. They've been maybe watching from Nazareth, his ministry, and seeing what's going on here, and they become uneasy. As Jesus became more and more popular, the crowds that followed him grew larger and larger, and now Jesus is drawing the ire of the religious leaders. He's drawing the ire of the Herodians now, we saw uh, there at the uh, end of... Uh, uh, verse 6 there, where they begin to plot together. So now you have not just the religious leaders, but now the governmental authorities who are beginning to conspire against Jesus, wanting to take his life. But his ministry is becoming more popular. The crowds are drawing in, even to the point where Jesus is concerned he's going to be crushed. And his family feels the need at this point to intervene. So we see down in verse 31 that Jesus' mother and brothers came to Capernaum. And the names of the brothers are actually listed in Mark chapter 6. They were James, who we know some about there, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon. We read also they had at least two sisters. By the way, take a little, little rabbit chase here. This says something to us about Jesus' mother and his earthly father and the household that they had, and it says something that is important for us. If you look, for example, to Roman Catholicism, you will be taught the perpetual virginity of marriage. Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of God, and that was that. And then you have Mary who goes on forever and she becomes co-redemptrix and co-mediatrix with Christ. She becomes our mediator. She becomes a redeemer. And so you have that sort of false theology that's born out there. But here we see Jesus' mother and his brothers and his sisters laid out for us clearly in the scripture. There were other children who were born. And so we can take that and lay that aside, this worship of Mary and this exaltation of Mary. Listen, certainly blessed by God to bring the Savior into the world, but the worship that is given to her is a dangerous thing. And we see here part of that being undermined by the fact that Jesus has siblings. Anyway, Mary and the brothers, they're coming to Capernaum to see Jesus. They're concerned for him. And we see what they have to say. Now, I think we can probably give Mary a little bit of slack here. Uh, it's likely she's coming along with her sons. But given what we know about her, it's unlikely that she actually believes that Jesus, at this point, is out of his mind. Mary had been visited by the angel. She had experienced all sorts of miraculous events surrounding the Lord's birth. And she had committed herself as a faithful servant of God, to see him raised in the faith, to see him growing in his knowledge of the things of God, prepared to fulfill his purpose. And we can be certain that she remembered those things, right? We see later times in the Lord's ministry when she was there and she was watching. And so, you know, we shouldn't write her off too easily here. But his brothers, for certain, had concerns. And they come to Capernaum where Jesus is staying at the house to try to take him home. 
it becomes clear that his brothers yet not, did not yet believe in Jesus, or, well, they probably believed in him. He existed, but they didn't believe that he was the Messiah that he claimed and that others claimed him to be. To them, he was their brother. That was it. And even though they were wrong at this point, it was probably because they loved their brother that they wanted to try to rescue him from harm. By their perspective, Jesus was putting himself in danger, and they believed it was all based upon a delusion. By their assessment, what does it say? His family thought he was out of his mind. Insane. So for, their own, for his own good, they're going to Capernaum to get their brother and to bring him home. It says there that they went out to seize him. That word seize is the same word that's used when the religious authorities and when the governing authorities went to lay their hands on Jesus and to take him into custody. They were prepared to bring Jesus home. They thought he was out of his mind. They're going to bring him back. And if they have to be a little bit violent to make that happen, they're going to do it. They're going to take him by force and they're going to carry him home. I don't think they believed him to be a bad guy. I think they knew him better than that. But they were convinced that something was wrong. And so for his safety, they come to take him home. So what do we find here? In terms of the way his own brothers would have looked at him, they looked at Jesus and they thought what? Something's wrong here. He's got a screw loose. This has gone to his head. He's not thinking clearly. He's out of his mind. In short, in the eyes of his own brothers, Jesus was a lunatic. You go to verse 22, and we're introduced to a second group of people. We see their way that they would respond to Jesus. We read that all, and the scribes and Pharisees who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. Now here we find the religious leaders making their strongest accusations against Jesus yet. At first they had considered him to be a nuisance, and then a threat, and then eventually their hatred for him grew so much that they were working out how they were going to end his life. They were plotting with the Herodians to kill him. And so there was a big problem here with Jesus that they needed to deal with, but, but there was one thing that was always getting in the way. The miraculous power of the Lord Jesus was undeniable. There's no way around what's happening here, right? Everywhere Jesus goes, what's taking place? People are being freed from demonic possession. People are being healed of their sickness and disease. Like, there's no denying what's happening. When the Lord comes to town, things change. Jesus is working real miracles. The sick made well. Those with disease and lifelong disabilities being made whole. Dead being given life. Evil spirits cast out. And as much as they wanted to, they could not dispute these things. They could not deny that they were happening. And by this point, you've got tens of thousands of witnesses who have seen what Jesus does. So no one could come and make a claim that, look, this Jesus, he, he's not, none of this is real, right? It's all smoke and mirrors. You can't say that to the thousands of people at this point who have been delivered, who have been healed. So in desperation here, since they couldn't deny the Lord's power, these leaders decided they were going to bring the source of his power into question. It says here that the scribes came from Jerusalem. We know that these Pharisees were with Jesus every step of the way. They're following him around. They're criticizing everything he does. But they're not having much luck trying to deal with him. Every time they thought they trapped him, Jesus just kind of outsmarted them, right? He, they would question him on something, and he would ask them a question in return that would just expose the, the darkness of their own hearts and show that they didn't really understand God's word. So they're not doing so well. So you might say at this point they're calling in the big guns, right? They're going to bring the scribes in from Jerusalem. These were the, the most elite of the elite among the party of the Pharisees. They were their most skilled lawyers. And they've called them in to make an evaluation of what's happening with this man Jesus. And they come and they bring a very serious accusation. While Jesus claimed to come from God, to be God to be acting with the authority and the power of God in obedience to his Father, doing his will. What they said is no. That's not the case. He is actually a great deceiver. He is not a servant of God. He's a servant of the devil. Perhaps even under the control of the devil himself. They said of Jesus, he is possessed by Beelzebul. Beelzebul. 
and by the prince of demons, he cast out the demons. That title, Beelzebul, it goes back to the worship of Baal, the pagan nations you read about in the Old Testament. Used in this form, it referred to the Lord of the flies or the Lord of the dung heap. That's what this name meant. It was a title that was often used to mock the devil. Great deceiver that he is. And the scribes of the Pharisees then are putting that title, associating that title with the Lord Jesus. They couldn't deny his power. Did he work with great power? Sure he did. But they wanted people to believe his power did not come from above. His power came from below. His power was not God's power. It was the devil's power. And as a servant of that great deceiver, Jesus then was deceiving them all. Sure, he cast out demons, but only under the power of the prince of demons himself. All this is a ruse. That's what they're suggesting. It's, it's all meant to lure you away from the true religion that we've laid before you and to take you into the authority of the devil himself. He's putting you into bondage. If they couldn't convince the crowds that Jesus was not doing what he was obviously doing, perhaps if they could associate his work with the devil, then they could convince people to abandon him and put an end to his popularity. So they accuse him, possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of darkness, he cast out demons. Of course, Jesus is going to respond to this. He's not going to leave that accusation unanswered. He speaks to the crowd and it says he, he, he speaks to them in parables. Perhaps in the midst of this, by the way, or where some of these other parables of the kingdom that you read in the other gospels might come into play. But we're told of one particular lesson he shared in response to the scribes. You know, sometimes you think about parables. Sometimes those parables, they're veiled, right? So you've got to dig a little bit before you can understand what's going on here. These statements are pretty straightforward. He lays some things out there, but he, but he kind of takes some, some things that they all would understand that would make perfect sense, and he's applying those to what's happening with Jesus as he's going about his father's business, as he's healing the sick and casting out demons. And so he says to them, beginning of verse 23, Translation, y'all kind of dumb. This doesn't make any sense, right? How can Satan cast out Satan? Doesn't that sound a little weird? Don't work that way. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and, divide, and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. Look, if you go to war with yourself... You're just, you're just accelerating your demise, right? You're, you're adding to your own destruction. We can look through history and we can see when nations are divided against themselves, they fall. We ought to take note of that, by the way. When houses are divided, they fall. How can Satan cast out Satan? If Satan rises against himself, he will not stand, but he is coming to an end. This statement is foolish. It doesn't make any sense at all. Jesus is using language that could be easily understood by the crowds here. He spent his ministry up to this point writing things that were wrong. He's healing sick. He's freeing the oppressed. The consequences of life in this fallen world are being reversed by the work of Jesus during his time on earth. The work of the devil to bring sickness and disease and oppression as a result of sin, that's being overcome. And now the scribes accuse him of being possessed by the devil and thus a promoter of sin and its effects. In what world would that make sense? It doesn't make any sense. And so he refutes that. You divide the house, it's going to self-destruct. It's going to crumble from the inside out. How would Satan go about putting an end to his own empire? We know he's fighting every step of the way. These demons, when they encounter the Lord Jesus, they're fighting every step of the way, just trying to, to lengthen their days however they can. Doesn't make any sense. Instead, Jesus says, look, if you want to deal with an enemy, you want to pillage an enemy, you've got to deal with the strong man first. He says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. It's ought to make sense to us, right? You can't enter into a strong man's house and take his stuff 
until you deal with the man himself. Right? You, you, you decide you're going to go to somebody's house in the middle of the night and, and take things that belong to them, and you're going to take them to yourself. You better be aware of what's waiting for you on the other side of the door, right? If you want this to go well, you better be ready to deal with the threats that are on the other side of that. If you're going to plunder the strong man's house, you've got to bind him first. And Jesus says, look, you need to understand, that's what's happening right now. This nonsense about Satan being at war against Satan, it doesn't make any sense, but let me tell you what's really going on here. Satan is the strong man. He's holding people in bondage. He's enslaving them as trophies in his war against what is light. And then comes Jesus with all power, with authority. He comes from God as God. And what's he doing? He's binding up that strong man, the devil, and he's taking, or maybe we should say taking back what rightfully belongs to God. We're right in the context, and he read there in Matthew chapter 12, this man who's possessed by a demon and who as a result is blind and mute, and Jesus delivers him, and that's when they start to make these accusations. Now Jesus is saying, look, that's Satan's plunder right there, and I've bound the enemy, and I'm taken what he's consumed for himself. He's taking back those who are sick and oppressed. He's making them healthy and whole and free. He is destroying the kingdom of darkness and he is ushering in the kingdom of light. The scribes' accusations here are ridiculous. Satan is not at war against Satan. Jesus has come from God as God. He has bound Satan and he is taking the plunder as he wins people for himself. The accusations are foolish. So he rebukes their accusations and then he gives them a very serious warning. Something else going on here. Jesus goes from this defense of his ministry. This is not Satan against Satan. This is me coming to bind the strong man Satan to put an end to his reign. But he moves from that to this strong condemnation of these religious leaders who have spoken ill against him and he warns them about the consequences of what they're doing. Look at verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now those verses right there have led to a lot of discussion and a lot of questions and they drive us toward what has been often been called the unpardonable sin. If you've been around the church world very long, you've been in the scripture much, you, you've, 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 you've come across this, you've heard these conversations, something the church has discussed throughout the ages. What is that unpardonable sin, right? Maybe you've heard about this. I, I, I've heard some people say that it's murder. You ever heard that? That's a sin that can't be forgiven. I've heard people say that it's adultery. You ever heard that? That's a sin that can't be forgiven. Well, if you're going to make those arguments, you're going to have a hard time. Let's think about David. He's a good example of a murderer and an adulterer, and yet God was gracious, right? He restored him. He renewed him. He cared for him. He was a man after his own heart. I've heard people say that homosexuality is the unpardonable sin. And yet we have in the New Testament these long lists of sin, among which that's included, and among which a lot of the more respectable sins that we're guilty of are included. And what does he say? Such were some of you, but now you've been delivered and you're walking with the Lord Jesus. So that doesn't make any sense. I've heard some people say that it's suicide. No way out after that, right? How do you get to that kind of despair? And yet we see all through the scripture, even in the depths of despair, God showing mercy. And I don't think we can make that case at all. We get the idea from scripture that all sin, all manner of sin, can be forgiven, save this one thing that's being set apart here that leaves us guilty for all eternity. And there's a lot of debate and discussion, a lot of confusion and fear and hand-wringing about what this is. Maybe you've thought before as a believer, oh, what's that sin? Have I committed it? Lord, help me, have mercy. By the way, the odds are if you're asking yourself that question, you probably haven't committed that sin. 
I think a lot of what's been said here is unnecessary. But we do need to deal with it. A lot of people had a lot of theories, and I think a lot of them aren't very helpful, but, but let's think it through here. What would be this eternal, unpardonable sin, and how can we avoid it? Well, he mentions here this idea of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But what is that really? I'll, I'll give you a short version, at least from my perspective, as best as I can understand it. I believe when it comes down to it, this eternal, unpardonable sin, this blasphemy against the Spirit is actually pretty simple. I think it would be this, to reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to deny the truth of his gospel until the end, to the point of death after which comes judgment. And if that's true, then the way that you can avoid committing this unpardonable sin is simply this. Turn from your sin. Put your hope, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear his gospel and obey his call. Know him as Savior, as Lord. I think that's the short version. But let's think it through a little bit. Let's just think in context of the gospels and what we've seen so far. Jesus has been ministering for a while. All of the evidence testifies that he is God. He is Messiah. He is the Christ who they've been waiting for, this Savior that they knew would come. From his birth to his baptism to the way he taught the scripture with authority to healing the sick and curing diseases to healing the disabled to raising the dead to casting out demons. Every aspect of Jesus' life and ministry gives testimony to the fact that he is the one they've been waiting for who would come from God. Now again, in Matthew's account of this confrontation, we just saw this miracle, a man who's possessed by a demon. As a result, he's blind and mute. And he's brought to Jesus. He's freed from the demon's clutches. He can speak. He can see. And the crowds are marveling. And Matthew 12, 23 tells us this. It says that all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? You, you see something starting to, to, to kind of come alive just a little bit, am I right? Is this really the guy? They're beginning to see the truth of who Jesus is, and they're asking these very important questions. But that's not going to fly for these religious leaders. They can't have it. They're so obsessed with their own importance, and they're so desperate to discredit Jesus that they're willing to deny the clear testimony and power of God's Holy Spirit as the scriptures, these promises from the prophets, are being brought to life before their very eyes. They're so desperate to deal with Jesus that they're willing to deny the work of the Spirit and instead to attribute that to the devil. That's how hard their hearts are. They're closed off to any understanding of God's saving grace. And the warning I believe they're getting here is that if they persist in that, you continue in your hardness of heart, you continue to deny what's clearly being laid out right in front of you, then you are going to die in your sin and you will face eternal condemnation as a result. I believe that is this severe, dangerous, unpardonable sin that's going to lead to their destruction. I think that's it right there. You see clearly laid out before you the power of God at work, but you won't have it. And you're coming up with every possible explanation and even attributing the works of the Spirit to the devil himself. And there will be a price to pay. I like what Pastor Ken Hughes said about this. He said, what is this unforgivable sin, this unforgivable blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Very simple. It is the ongoing, continual rejection of the witness of the Holy Spirit to the divinity and the saviorhood of Christ. It is the perversion of the heart that chooses to call light darkness and darkness light. It is the continuing rejection of the witness of the Holy Spirit, whether that witness be a quiet witness in the conscience, the rational witness of the word, or even miracles and wonders. I think that's a good summary of what it would mean here to blaspheme the Spirit, to see clearly the truth of Christ, and to reject it nonetheless. I want nothing to do with it. That is ultimately what will condemn every single man, woman, and boy, woman, boy and girl who has lived, who does live, who will live. That is what will lead us to eternal condemnation, a rejection of the gospel, a failure to put our faith, our hope, our trust in Jesus Christ alone as Lord and Savior. 
Now, you see what's happening here with these scribes and these Pharisees, and it's pretty extreme. They're witnesses directly to these things that have happened. And yet, what did we talk about just this morning in our Sunday school? Peter was a witness of the transfiguration on the mountain, and yet he says, you've got something even better. You've got a word more sure that's been preserved for you, a word that you can trust, that's a light for you in the darkness, that's leading you to the truth, that's going to protect you and guide you. We have testimony. We have it in the word, and we have it beyond the word. I mean, what does Romans say? Take a look at the world around you. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So what? They are without excuse. God has revealed himself. In the creation that we enjoy every day. He's written his law, the next chapter tells us, on our hearts. There's a reason we know what is right and what is wrong. We understand sin even if we don't know the word to call it. We know of the character of God, of the majesty of God, of the power of God. And certainly, those of us who are blessed to have his word see it laid out in much greater detail. But we're told here that everyone is without excuse. There's no one who's ever lived who can claim true ignorance to any of the things of God. God reveals himself. And he testifies through his Holy Spirit to who he is. And so we all have to deal with that in one way or another, don't we? We're going to embrace what God has revealed. We're going to place our hope in him alone. We're going to receive every promise he has for those who are his own. Or we're going to harden our hearts. We're going to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We're going to deny his works or we're going to credit them to someone or to something else. That passage in Romans, it says, look, God's clearly revealed himself and so we're without excuse. It goes on to say that, look, they traded the glory of God for the created things. They began to worship idols instead of worshiping the God who has created this world. They were attributing his power, his glory to other things. And so he turned them over to condemnation. God has revealed himself He makes himself known. And if, as God reveals himself, we suppress that truth and we deny him, if we assign his power, his glory, his majesty, his blessing to something else, then we're in danger. That's what's happening with these Pharisees and these scribes. They can't deny the miracles. The power is on display. Well, that's not God. That's the devil. He's a son of the devil. Don't you dare listen to that man. He's dangerous. And he tells them, You better beware. All sin is forgiven, the children of man, whatever blasphemies they utter. We're thankful for that, by the way, aren't we? But the one who blasphemes the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness and is guilty of eternal sin. The unpardonable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, I believe, I'm convinced, is this, to resist the Spirit's work, to persist in unbelief, to do whatever you can do to talk yourself out of believing the gospel. And the only way to avoid it is to come to Jesus by faith, to embrace him as Savior and as Lord. But we see pretty clearly, at least at this point, the scribes and the Pharisees, they couldn't do that. They were too hard-hearted. They were too committed to their own gain. They could not accept the truth, no matter how clearly it was laid out before them. So they had to come up with some other explanation. So what do they do? They attribute the work of God to the devil. They could not embrace Jesus as Lord, so they called him a liar. He's a deceiver. And then finally, we're introduced to the third group. Verse 31 tells us that Jesus' mother and his brothers, you know, that we already see that they've come. They're coming to take him by force if they have to, to drag him back home to Nazareth. But we see that they arrive in verse 31. Word makes its way through the crowd that somewhere out there, they've come. And so they say to Jesus, your your mother and your brothers are outside. They're seeking you. And he answers them and he says, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, Matthew adds that he motioned with his hand at the time. He said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, Jesus' words at times have been misunderstood, I think, as a slight against his family. 
I, I don't think that Jesus thought poorly of his family. I don't think he intended them any particular disrespect. We see his love for his family unfolding in the Gospels in different ways. You look to the end of Jesus' life and you see that he was concerned for the welfare of his mother and making sure that she had others who would watch over her and care for her. But I think what we see here is that while Jesus loved his earthly family and certainly would continue in good relationship with them moving forward, we see more of that as it goes. He's making a point here. There's a bond that goes deeper than that between members of a family. And it's those who are brought together by faith. I asked the church in, in this local body, and I believe across the boundaries of time and place even, Scripture tells us that we are the household of God. We are brothers and sisters with each other as we are united in Christ. We're told that God is our Father, even when we are fatherless in this world. And so we, we have all this family language that's used to describe the people of God. And what we find in the family of faith is a very great, a very wholesome, a very strong and edifying bond that we can't share in any other context. It's an amazing thing to know that wherever we go, when we are with believers, we're with kinfolk, right? We're with our family. I've mentioned some of this before, and you guys have experienced it too, right? Isn't it something when you can go to somewhere into a culture you don't share, where people speak a language that you don't know, and yet you can find warmth and care and commonality in ways that will just blow your mind. When you're with the Lord's people, there's something different about that, right? We build all sorts of earthly relationships. We have our family, we have our friends, but man, there is something about being with the people of God. To be able to go into your workplace and to find that person who's a fellow believer, does that change your relationship with them versus your relationship with other coworkers? You get involved in recreation, right? You join a club, you play a, play a sport, you do whatever, and you, 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 know, you begin to connect with those people. And you learn about this common bond. I mean, those relationships can just sprout up and grow just really quick, right? It's an incredible thing. And you go out on the mission field. You meet brothers and sisters in other places, and you can say, look, I can't even talk to you, but I love you, right? And there's just that warmth and that bond there that is just, it, it, it's, it's, it can only come from the Lord. And even within our families, Look, parents, we love our children. And I'm still, I mean, I'm still waiting, I'm watching, but some of you can testify. Boy, isn't there something? When one of those kids, man, the Lord works. He opens their heart. He opens their mind. They understand the gospel. They take hold. They're putting their faith in Jesus. Does that change your relationship as parent and child? You're still the parent. They're still the child. But does that, does that, does that make that bond that much stronger? And the gospel ties us together. In amazing ways. Now Jesus knows what his, what his brothers are up to. He knows they think he's out of his mind. He knows they want to take him home. That's not going to happen. He's not going to let that happen. He's got work to do. But when they come, I don't think he means to insult his family. I think he's pointed to something greater. Who are my mother and my brothers? And he looks around. He says they're right here. Dr. R.C. Sproul he said this, he said, these words, which may seem slightly rude on the surface, were not a denial or a repudiation by Jesus of his mother and his brothers. Instead, they are profound teaching about the union we have with Christ. Jesus declared that those who believe in him and do God's will have a relationship with him that is closer than the blood relationship between parents, children, and siblings. We must never lose sight of the fact that we are bound to Jesus by mighty and mystical cords that cannot be broken. And I think we understand that. And I think we see that in our earthly relationships. Even when you're married, man, there's nobody you're closer to than your spouse, right? But man, if you've been married to someone who's not a believer, and then they become a believer, or maybe neither one of you are believers, but now you're walking with Christ, does it change everything? Jesus says, these are the people who are my family. The ones who were with Jesus, the ones who he had called to himself, these were the people who were ultimately united with Christ in that deepest union, and these were the ones who confessed him as Lord. And how do we know they confessed him as Lord? What does he say about them? They do the will of God. The one who confesses Jesus as Lord obeys his word. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's my mother, he says.
Jesus is a lunatic. He's out of his mind. He's a liar. He doesn't come from God. He comes from the devil. Or he's Lord. We all have to ask that question. Who is Jesus? We have to answer it in one way or another. I think it's interesting we think this through. We're going to come to one of those same conclusions. Now, we might not use the same words. We, we would not dare say that Jesus was a crazy man. Most of us. There's some people out there that do that. If they want to choose the route of blasphemy, they can go down that road. That's, that's a dangerous thing, but most of us wouldn't say that. But we do the kind of things we've talked about here and the things we talked about even in our Sunday school some this morning. Jesus was a good man. He was a good teacher. Ah, I really don't get into all that other stuff. No, that's not for me. Well, if that other stuff is not for you, you're going to have to explain it somehow. We won't use those words. What do we believe? The reality is, and we'll just bring it to close with this, there's, there's one way that we're going to know Jesus as he's meant to be known. There's one way we're going to know him that's going to allow us to know him as Savior, as Lord. There's one way we're going to know Jesus if we're going to have the hope of eternity. That is to come to him as Lord. We can't try to write him off. We can't look at that other stuff as crazy talk. We can't say, oh no, there were, there were ugly things going on there. Look, Jesus came as God to do the work of God, to bind the strong man, to take away the plunder, to win a people for himself, and he's doing that every day as the gospel goes forward. And so I would say to you this morning, hear the call of the gospel. Do not harden your heart against the work of the Spirit that bids you to come to Jesus as Lord. As you experience in your life through this world that God has made, through that conscience within you that testifies to your own sin, as you hear the word proclaimed, and you are called to put your hope and your trust in Jesus who came from God as God to do the work of God, to give himself as a sacrifice for sin, to pay the price for our sin so that we could be given his righteousness. Hear the call of the gospel. Do not harden your hearts. Do not find some other way to kind of dismiss this stuff. Look, if you're here right now and you're like, look, I come here because it's a good thing and I can learn good stuff and I can be a good person. Look, that ain't going to fly. When it comes to the judgment, Jesus is Lord, or he is something else. He is Lord, or he will not save. And so I would encourage you to put your hope in him. Do not persist in that sin of unbelief. Do not blaspheme the Spirit, which leads to eternal judgment. But hear the call of the Spirit and hope in Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word we thank you for the power of your son that's on display as he comes into this world and works his miracles. God, we thank you for the promise of salvation that we have in him. And God, we thank you for the warning that we receive from your word. The warnings we've discussed today, even in our small groups, warnings against false teachers who would lead us astray, and warnings against those who would try to turn us in whatever way from acknowledging Jesus for who he is. God, we confess that we must either take Jesus as he is in your word or we will not have him at all. And so God, would you work through your Holy Spirit even now to convict our hearts, to show us our sin, and to show us the reality of the Savior and God, would you work in such a way that we will not turn that away, but that we will respond to the call of your spirit. We will hear it. We will obey. We will turn from our sin. And we will hope in Christ. God, we are thankful for the bond we share as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. And God, I pray that you would strengthen that bond in our fellowship as you bring us nearer to you. And as you bring others who are in this room into that spiritual family that will last forever. God, help us to hear your word today, to consider its truth, and to respond faithfully as you call us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Folks, it's been good to be with you. Look forward to seeing you again this evening, 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Have a great evening.